Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this live stream presentation, Recovering from Wildfire, a 20-year perspective of the Cerro Grande Fire with Craig Martin. I'm Liz Martino, the Executive Director of the Los Alamos Historical Society, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Our museum is currently closed, but we still have many ways you can explore the history of Los Alamos. Check out our website, losalamoshistory.org, for our online exhibit about the Cerro Grande fire called Resilience and Recovery, where you can leave your own stories. We will also have Terry Fox's book, Resilience and Regrowth, available in our museum shop. It also has stories about the Cerro Grande fire. We are able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors. So I'd like to send a special shout out to you for your general support. If you'd like to join us, please visit our website, losalamoshistory.org. All donations are greatly appreciated, especially since we're missing tourists who provide a significant part of our revenue. There can be no one better to speak about the Cerro Grande fire and its aftermath than Craig Martin. With his background as a biologist and forester, he organized the Volunteer Task Force to restore trails and educate the community about fire ecology. Martin's work led to the restoration of several trails, the rebuilding of the Camazon and Perimeter Trails, replanting in the burned areas, and the creation of a nature trail guide. For those accomplishments, Martin was selected for the National Volunteer of the Year Award of 2001 by the Points of Light Foundation. He also received the Chiefs Award from U.S. Forest Service in 2002. Before coming to Los Alamos in 1987, Craig worked for the National Park Service, the Arizona Sonoro Desert Museum, and taught science. He's authored several books, some of them available in our museum shop, and was named a living treasure of Los Alamos in 2013. It's my pleasure to welcome Craig Martin. Take it away, Craig. All your faces on the, on the video here. Um, people who have actually participated in a lot of these projects, they're probably in this photo here. <clears throat> so like everybody else, um, May 10th was kind of a turning point for, for me. Uh, at 12 noon that day, I had a job interview at Chamisa Elementary to possibly become a sixth grade teacher, an opportunity I was looking forward to. I walked out of the job interview confident that the job would be offered, but I looked up and I saw a column rising above the mountain. And for some reason, I said, I can't take this job. There'll be too much to do. I have no idea what I meant by that at that time. But this is the story of how I and how the community, more importantly, responded to that fire event. It's a story of Los Alamos resiliency that I hope uh, speaks to the current time that we're in and to the future. So let's get started here. Here's what we woke up to when we came back to town in uh, mid-May of 2000, uh, a landscape that was rather different than what we had left when we all evacuated and went down to Albuquerque or Santa Fe or Pawaki, wherever we went. On the ground, it was even more startling. Here's a photo from, 2000, from 1994 of my family hiking in, along the Mitchell Trail. The uh, photo on the right is the exact same scene on May 24, 2000. You could, uh, hopefully you can match this tree here with this tree here and then match the rest of the trees. Um, this was something that we all had to uh, adapt to and, and learn to live with. But we all had a, a common experience, several common experiences. We all evacuated town together in a smoky environment in a massive traffic jam. And then that night we sat in front of the TV somewhere and watched the houses burning and what this did was binded us together as a, as a community. I think we all started when we had our shared experiences and said, this, this is really changing the, the town. So 
when we all came back, the first thing I asked and lots of other people asked was, how can we help this situation? And we had some thoughts, you know, I mean, we thought, well, we'll just help our friends who lost their home because we had several friends that, that lost their homes. But that was not something that was an easy thing to do. They were busy with paperwork. They were busy with insurance claims. There was nothing that most of us could do to help our friends. We, we needed some kind of positive action. You know, here's people who are, are, are volunteering to answer the phones to see what, you know, how, how to get some help. Uh, th this was a community response right away, right after the fire. Uh, everybody wanted to say thank you to the firefighters. Uh, and another reason we were all anxious to get out there and do something. But the one thing that we didn't realize maybe at the time was we also needed to heal from the loss of the landscape that we knew and loved. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight is how the community of Los Alamos came to terms with the loss of landscape following the Sarah Grande fire. And we're going to look at that through the roles that the Forest Service and the Bandelier National Monument played. We're going to look at what we as a community did, because this is not Craig's story, this is the community's story. We are going to look at the people who you might not know who were behind the scenes that made this thing really happen, made it really work. We're going to look at did it really work? And then we're going to look at the long-term changes to the community that uh, still, still are with us as, as we uh, continue to live through the year 2020. Big thing, if you weren't here at the time, uh, you probably never heard the words hydrophobic soil. When a fire burns that hot, the soil becomes encoded with a waxy layer from all the organic materials that are, are laying on the ground, particularly pine needles. If you see a uh, Tesla's pouring some water on the ground here that normally we just get soaked in to, to the, the surface, uh, but with hydrophobic soil, it doesn't happen, it runs off. And if you get a quarter inch rainstorm over maybe 30 minutes, you get a little bit of rain and you get a little bit of flow. Uh, and you can see that that's not a normal amount of flow for a normal quarter inch rainfall. And then if you get an inch and a half rain in 30 minutes, this is what the result is. This is uh, Rendia Canyon a, a year after the fire when hydrophobic soil was still prevalent up in the upper reaches of the watershed. So the first thing you do is figure out uh, how can we stop this from damaging more of the town because the fire is the, is the first thing and then comes the floods. What happens after every major fire is a burned area emergency rehabilitation or response team is put together uh, from people from all the uh, federal agencies, Forest Service, Park Service, in this case, Lionel folks were uh, involved. Uh, the county also was involved. Uh, but people love to make maps uh, as you can see on the wall there. But what they're really do focused on is stabilizing the watershed to reduce post-fire flooding. And this is important because you, you think that the fire is, is the, the, the last thing that's going to do damage to the town, but that's not the way it works. Emergency is the key in that name, Burned Area Emergency Response Team, because we were six weeks away from the monsoon season when rains were expected to start. And uh, that, that was lucky because six weeks was a long time. I've done a couple of bear assignments over the years and we, sometimes we've had two weeks before the monsoon was predicted to start. So it is really an emergency. So the folks get together, they talk about first, uh, what are the values at risk? What do we need to protect more than anything else? And uh, the first one is always the road to the hospital. That's just kind of a standard thing that uh, they, they present to everybody. Uh, there's also things that you might not think of. Uh, how do we protect the cultural resources that are within the burned area or downstream from the burned area? And in the case of Los Alamos, it was kind of special because there's a canyon in the middle of town that had plutonium sitting in the sediments. It was kind of bound there with the mud and sitting there for 50 years, but the watershed above it had just been severely burned. And there was a serious problem to uh, contain that contamination from moving downstream onto the downstream uh, properties. The, the bear team gets together and comes up with a plan. The map is a, is a colorful map that shows all the different kinds of treatments that they were gonna to throw together to help stop the runoff uh, peak flows 
immediately post fire. Some of the things that they could use were log erosion barriers that are just logs thrown across the landscape. Straw wattles, you've probably still seen those around town. If you're hiking, they're still um, staked into the ground in places. Aerial seeding, hydro mulching, and straw mulch and seeding. Anything that you can do in a, in a cost effective way is prioritized in these treatments. And you can see it's a pretty complicated problem. So that doesn't answer the question for the community still answering, what can we do to help recover from this fire? We can't do log erosion barriers because that's a chainsaw, cut the tree down, take 17 guys to move the log, put it into a trench. What can we do? The agencies within three weeks after the fire had established what they called the multi-agency volunteer task force. And all of these groups were part of that. And they said, how do we help the community heal through getting them into the land, the burned landscape, and at the same time using their labor force of thousands of volunteers to actually make a difference in preventing post-fire runoff? The one of the bear team guys. This is, Greg, this is Greg Kilmjian. We call him Papa Bear because he goes on bear assignments uh, often, and. Uh, I've traveled around with him a couple of, to a couple of fires, and uh, he, he is the, the, the best bear guy in, in the fire service. He had always wanted to try something in one of these post-fire situations uh, that he never had a chance to try because there was never enough manpower. And he said, well, wait a minute, we've got people who are coming out of the wall, the wall work, and they want to volunteer, so let's try this. Let's try raking, seeding, and mulching. So the big thing here is you rake the ground, you break up that hydrophobic soil. And the, the rake is just a, you know, a physical way of doing that. You're cutting grooves into that, that waxy layer. Once you've got that done, then you can seed to provide for a future ground cover. Uh, the grass seeds are, have, have lots of, grasses have lots of roots that bind the soil together. So you're trying to get a lot of grasses to grow as fast as you can, with they're not gonna grow right away. So what Greg wanted to try was mulching to provide an immediate ground cover and that would create a, a layer of moisture in, in between the ground and the mulch that would help break down the hydrophobic soil that hadn't been taken care of by the raking process. So this is how it all got started. The Multi-Agency Volunteer Task Force, we all met at the library. Uh, we signed in, made sure that we had the proper safety equipment, the proper tools. This must have been an early um, work party because th these are really wimpy rakes for, for working out in the woods. I mean, this is your garden rake. Later on, we had McLeods, which are really stout tools. If you go to the historical museum exhibit, you'll see one of those. I think it's online too. Uh, we all loaded into buses and drove to the work sites. Uh, here's the, the raking process. That's a real McLeod. That's a, a heavier tool that was really effective in breaking up the hydrophobic soil. Uh, we'd have uh, 500 people a day out in, in maybe three or four different places at the, at the time. Uh, people raking, then people throwing seed on the ground to get that grass started, and then covering it with straw mulch. This was the really hard work because the, the hay bales are, are pretty heavy. Folks uh, from the Forest Service and uh, the other agencies were, were there on hand to make sure that, that there was plenty of straw. You would take one of those, uh, I forget what those little chunks of a hay bale are called, but you take one of those and you would go out and scatter it where the rake, raking and the seeding had already been done and cover the ground with yellow. It, it was an amazing process to watch and it was only possible because we had 500 people out there a day doing this. It was a really good thing and everybody said, well, we got to keep doing it. And the inspiration behind or the, uh, the, the brains behind it at this point were Al Toth from the Los Alamos Police Department. Al made sure that this volunteer program um, reached as much of the community as, as was possible. So for four weekends, we went out and, and seated and raked each week, getting more and more volunteers each week covering more and more ground. Pretty soon we had little kids helping us. This is my son actually, and I didn't take this picture. Al took this picture. Uh, that's me in the background there. Um, 
we went and into the Mitchell Terrell area. Uh, here, I'm, I'm just trying to show my son that, you know, that there's really important work that has to be done post-fire. Um, his, his little buddy here didn't like his uh, hard hat, so um, Joe had to have his bicycle helmet on. This is what it looks like from the air when you throw a lot of straw on the ground. And you can see that that would provide a buffer between the steeper slopes in the background and the, the, uh, the town site down in here. So did using volunteers work? Well, we had 500 volunteers a day, six volunteer days were run by the, the, the multi-agency volunteer task force. That accumulated 23,000 hours of volunteer work in those first few weeks, pretty amazing. 600 acres were seeded and mulched. That was a huge amount because it had never been done before. How did so many volunteers show up? Well, personally, it was, wait a minute, I wanna go back into the woods, even though the woods are very changed, I wanted to be there, I wanted to see what was going on. And I think a lot of other volunteers said, that's what we want, we, we need to regain a touch with, with that landscape so that we can help the healing process. It was real work that made a real difference. We actually, there, there were all kinds of uh, calculations done on how much runoff was reduced by that mulching effort and it was significant. We still had post-fire floods, but uh, they were not as big as they would have been without that seeding and mulching. And this group didn't really start this process here where we're at, but as we were doing the, the restoration work, there were people out there talking about why this fire had happened, uh, how the forest was in a, an unhealthy state, how there were too many trees, and uh, what, what we needed to do in the future to, to make it so that this didn't happen again. So there was an educational opportunity. But did it really work? This is a 2001 photo with a 2000 mulched area on the left side of the screen. It's green with the grasses that were seeded. And this is a freshly mulched 2001 area you can see how sparse the grass is in that right-hand side of the photo compared to the left side. There, that's a dramatic line that was drawn by stopping the mulching right there in the center of the photo in the year 2000, and then picking up on it a year later because we, by then we knew that it was a really effective way to get things restarted. The seeding was so successful that the following year, the Forest Service authorized another 600 acres, which was good because we had groups like this, the labor of love from someplace in Texas, showing up with 100 teenagers to do volunteer work. And you know, wh what do you do with them? If, well, there was lots of seating and raking that, that we could still do. So we did another 600 acres in the year 2001. Here's a, an effect of the fire that and, and the volunteer effort in Los Alamos that most people don't realize, the success of the seeding and, and raking and mulching volunteer effort here went to the Rodeo Chetuscai fire, which was five times bigger than this, uh, than the Sarah Grande fire. And the Forest Service, led by Greg Kilmgen again, used helicopters to drop the straw on areas that had been seeded. There were still some volunteer projects but most of the area was covered by lifting a bale of, of straw up into a net, flying over an area, releasing the net, opening it up, and scattering that stuff. So they covered probably six or seven times the amount of uh, landscape using straw mulch that, that we, we did in Cerro Grande. But it's only because it was the Los Alamos proved that it worked, and the Forest Service made it a standard problem. So on a little more personal thing, um, it's, it's getting into people and people healing. The Mountain School program started uh, when Laura Patterson and Gary Washburn, who were teachers, sixth grade teachers at Mountain School, came back from evacuation and said, you know, our kids, a third of our kids just lost their homes. We, we got to do something in the classroom that helps them recover what they've lost and helps them under, understand fire and the role fire plays in a healthy ecosystem. They went and found uh, John Hogan, who uh, was a friend of Laura's, and, and John and Laura and Gary went to the 
Institute, uh, the National Interagency Fire Center in uh, Montana, came up with some ideas for that those folks were doing and said, okay, now we have a, something that we can do in Los Alamos to help those kids at Mountain School specifically that uh, had lost so much. And that project was, let's have the sixth graders rebuild the Kimazon Nature Trail. The Nature Trail had been established probably in 1980, maybe before the history isn't quite clear, but uh, it was a, a easy loop close to town that had signposts that you could follow, uh, stories that the, the, uh, the Girl Scouts or, and Boy Scouts who had developed the trail had put together. And uh, the, the trail was, uh, was not there when, when uh, the, this project started. We got to transition here a little bit because uh, by August, the bear team is gone. The federal agencies pull out and John and I realize you know, hey, it's just us, but this is a really good thing. Why don't we keep it going? So what we did was establish the nonprofit volunteer task force, a creatively borrowed name because we couldn't think of anything else because everybody already knew us as the volunteer task force. So we just dropped the multi-agency thing, became a nonprofit and carried on the work from there. First thing that we did was that mountain school project where the mountain school kids not only did uh, the, the trail rebuilding, but they did uh, forest monitoring studies. They did fire ecology lessons. Uh, they, they learned how to use a GPS. They learned how to use tools. They spent a lot of time in the outdoor classroom. Uh, Laura and Gary were really good about bringing that into the English classroom also and, and having the kids write poetry about their experiences, uh, bringing in artists to, to create things from uh, like pine needles. So it, it was a total experience for those kids. Special programs, we'll just skip that one. So we wrote a grant, we got some tools, we take the kids up on the trail once a week, and we start rebuilding the trail. This is what it looked like when we first got there. Um, just a black landscape, no trail to be seen. Uh, there was a little, few little traces of it. Uh, the kids became so enthusiastic about doing trail work. There, there was, this was my first experience with using young folks as trail builders. And uh, you know, that's what I did for 15 years. Um, hey, Greg, I, I remember those kids coming back totally covered in black. <laughs> well, that's, that's because it became a symbol of, you know, how hard you worked if you smeared it all over your face so you looked really bad. I, I don't have any of those photos. <laughs> so they, they learned to work with tools. They scraped the, the trail back in. Uh, parents helped. Yeah, a great experience for everybody. And uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, there were a few posts left. We, we just kind of left the, the old burn posts there. We uh, took the, the, uh, the newer ones and put them in. And by 2004, we had revised the trail guide also. Uh, all, all written by students, all the illustrations by students, with poetry by students. Um, then we revised it again in 2010 because the landscape had changed so much. There had been so much recovery that went on that we just had to revise it a second time. We opened the trail in 2004 with uh, Gary and, and Laura, and uh, this is Dave Martin who wrote a special Kamazon trail song for the kids to sing for the opening. We uh, performed that in front of the county council also, but the trail was back and uh, as, as good as ever. The program at Mountain School continued a long time. In 2001, 2002, uh, John and I saw that it worked in mountain school and there were a lot of other kids who needed to learn about um, outdoor education, needed to have the experience of working with their hands outdoors. Uh, so we took it to all the elementary schools in Los Alamos, all the sixth graders. Uh, by 2003, we reached out to schools in Santa Fe also and, and had some of them come in and do the same kind of things. And then uh, Laura and I wrote a curriculum that uh, went to the, that was published by the National Forest Service on fire ecology that it was used in classrooms all over the country. Did it work? Well, all that stuff is fine and good. And yeah, we got a trail back and those kids had a great time and learned things. But this is Vanessa, formerly Chavez. 
this is in 2019, uh, Vanessa went up with us to reevaluate the trees that she had planted as a sixth grader in 2001. In 2019, Megan Rains with the middle school took a, a classroom, all of her science classes up to the Kimazon Trail and reevaluated the success of the tree planting. We'll look at that a little later, but Vanessa, former sixth grader, now a professional environmental scientist, joined us for that. There are 10 such students from Mountain School who went into environmental science careers after their experience at Mountain School. That's how I know it worked. My involvement in all this really starts where on May 24th when Miles Standish in the faded yellow shirt and Janie O'Rourke in the bright yellow shirt and I walked into the Mitchell Trail area to evaluate the, uh, the damage to the trail network. Uh, Janie and I were both completely uh, unaware of what to expect and what we saw was every time you took a footstep this cloud of ash would come up. You could almost see a trail as a small little dip in the landscape, but really all it was was black and disheartening. Well, Forest Service uh, said, asked me to evaluate all the, all the trails and then prioritize which ones to work on that summer. So in 2000, uh, th that summer, we went to the Kamazon Trail, which seemed to be the, the focus of the, the community's interest and started rehabilitating the trail in it, just in an emergency way to keep the, the post-fire floods from damaging the trail uh, in, in a way that was irreparable. Uh, that we remember riding and, and I asked the community for a, a picture of us riding in the back of a army vehicle and you know, one of those troop carriers that the Army Corps of Engineers chipped in and, and helped the Forest Service and us to do this kind of thing. But we went up there and did the uh, did the uh, on Trail that summer, even if it was just lining the trail with straw sometimes. In 2001, we could do some rehabilitation of water damage trails because by then runoff had been occurring and we, we needed to, to fix trails before we lost them. So. Uh, in 2001, I think we probably did about 10,000 hours on volunteer trail work. We did trail improvements like build massive walls along the, the, uh, the trail uh, through Rio Canyon. Everybody trying to kind of participate. This is Dorothy Horde doing trail work. Um, she was probably 72 at the time, didn't stop her. In 2002, we started taking middle school students up uh, to do trail work on the Pai Rio Trail and the trails over uh, on the far side of Barranca Mesa. And it, it was pretty crazy. I mean, we'd have 100 middle schoolers out there. We'd do an entire team of, of, of middle schoolers at, on one day. And we'd split them up. We'd have one group do trail work, and then another group would do something like plant trees, and another group would do some kind of science study. And uh, this this was a, a long-standing tradition for three or four years. I guess that's long-standing. Um, the middle school kids in eighth grade would always go up and do trail work. Did they love it? Uh, they weren't quite as enthusiastic as the sixth graders, but a lot of them um, stop me in the grocery store still and say, you know, I remember you. You were really mean to me. Uh, because uh, oh, Craig had this rule. You know what a Pulaski is? It's kind of an ax axe with a hoe on the back you know it's it's a boy looks at it and he goes oh ah, i want that uh, so craig had this rule it was the martin rule of Pulaski use if you are under the age of 16 and a male you may not have one of these in your hand unless you prove to me that you earned it and you, you know a lot of kids a lot of boys proved to me that they were responsible and and focused and they earned the right to use swing a Pulaski. By 2002, what we could do is look at, okay, well, we fixed up most of the trails that were, were damaged, uh, but you know, there's a lot of trails that really need to be redone. Uh, so we focused on trail network improvements uh, in, in the following years. Did it work? Well, yeah, we, you know, we, we had a great success with volunteer trail work for several years after that, but 
we reestablished 20 miles of trail that first year. And then we rebuilt the perimeter trail, which may or may not have actually been there when we started by 2002. Uh, we uh, it set up all these work parties that uh, continued until all the trails were rebuilt in 2010. So that's a pretty long standing uh, record of projects. Uh, it allowed the uh, family YMCA to establish their youth conservation program, which uh, is still going on, although this summer has been uh, canceled and postponed until next year. And uh, really, it led to the creation of the open space specialist position in 2003, which I served as uh, uh, for 12 years. Okay, so we got trails done. We got we got kids learning about fire ecology. But what everybody really wants to know is, we, we want to plant trees. We want to plant trees. That was the biggest thing that people wanted to see happen. Well, it's not an easy process because trees that get planted on a national forest have to come from seedlings that were grown from seeds collected locally in the same ecosystem. And then what they do is they store the those seeds in the seed bank in, in Idaho. And there were seeds, a lot of them, from the Hamas Mountains that were ready to go. And so they put it in order for 12,000 seedlings to be delivered uh, the following uh, April, when the, just before, while the soil is still wet after the, the wet winter that we really didn't have that year. But, Tree planting in November 2000, we, we asked for 100 seedlings to be rushed through the process so that we could have a special tree planting for people who had lost their homes. And if you go up along the first part of the Mitchell Trail, you'll see some fairly large seedlings that are now uh, somewhat taller, you know, 10 feet tall. One of them is labeled Granny's Tree because Granny planted that one. And uh, her plaque is still there because she had lost her home down the street. But, but that was a, the, f the first thing that I, I saw that was really a, a special time for people and tree planting. Trees come in boxes, you didn't know that. Trees get planted with dibble bars, which are 15 pound heavy sticks with a sharp point on the end. That sharp point has to go into the ground the full distance to get the roots of the seedling in there without bending. So it was quite a, quite a dramatic process. We, we had some ATV support from the Forest Service. Uh, PNM actually sponsored our first planting day in a PR move, which was really nice. They gave us all lunches and, and provided a good, good labor force. This is what it looked like. There, there was nothing growing up there at the time, except for some of the, the first sprouted grasses from that first aerial seeding mix. You take your dibble bar, you step on it, you wiggle it around, you get a hole in the ground that's six inches or 12, 12 inches deep, maybe nine inches deep. And then you plant your, put your seedling in it uh, with loving care, I might add, because that's, that's, that, that's what you see here is people really caring for every seedling they plant. We put rocks around them to retain some soil moisture. They, they uh, keep the soil damp so that they have a, a chance to get started before the summer rainy season develop. Uh, we also put these Vexar tubes around each of the seedlings to keep the deer from nibbling them. And if you look at, at areas that were planted in 2001, still you'll see some of those Vexar tubes wrapped around the trunks of, of ever-expanding trees. They were supposed to photo degrade in two years, but that didn't happen. It was easy to get a lot of people to plant trees. In fact, we had to take reservations and limit it to 60 volunteers a day because we only had 60 dibble bars. Um, but we did uh, six days of planting, got 12,000 trees in. And then the following year, the, the professionals came in and they had time to uh, see, to grow another 100,000 seedlings. The professionals came in and planted 100,000 trees in 2002. And you can see their work. Well, the Forest Service said, expect one out of three of your trees to survive, which was kind of discouraging to us all. But because of the loving care that people provided to each of those seedlings, because you know, it was our community and we were invested in every tree that we planted, the survival rate was much better. By uh, 
to, this is 2009, you can see that those uh, little nine inch seedlings that were only this big uh, are, are now, well, the kids from Mountain School went up and their average was 22 inches high in 2009. Not, not bad. Uh, when we went up with the middle school tree survey last October, we found that the average height was 12 feet and their diameter is, is now four inches uh, across. So yes, did it work? Yeah. Here's the most impressive thing to me. Here's a, we've planted at about a rate of 200 trees per acre. Sorry, it's Los Alamos, I have to have a graph. Uh, so we started out in 2001 with that. When we get to 2003, yeah, we lost maybe half of those. We didn't lose two thirds of them like we were told. We didn't lose much until 2000, through 2009, but we went up and counted in 2019, there were more trees. And the answer is, it's a second generation. The trees that we planted in 2001 are old enough to drop seeds and those seedlings are sprouting in a lot of places along the, the, the Kamazan Trail, at the Mitchell Trail. So uh, very successful project for us. Here's what it looks like on the ground. This is 2012, the little seedlings have grown, but now this is what it looked like in October or November. Um, definitely, you can see those from, from town now. And that, that was my, my goal when I said, uh, if we're gonna plant trees, let's just put them close to town so that people can see the success. I remember many times in the early, uh, mid 2000s, that people would stop me on the street and say, too bad those tree plantings didn't work because you couldn't see them at that point. But now you can definitely see those tree plantings from anywhere in town or out from the airport. It's, it's a beautiful sight to see. Making seed balls was the project developed by the Pario Plateau Watershed Partnership, which was a group of uh, watershed professionals who got together to try to solve some of the watershed problems in the uh, Pario Plateau. And the biggest problem was the burned area. But Kevin Buckley and others uh, from Lano got a grant from the NMED for watershed restoration. And it was to experiment with seed balls to improve ground cover in a burned watershed. So what are seed balls? Well, it's really the way you engage students in teaching about fire ecology and watershed restoration. But you have to do that by getting their hands dirty. Seed balls have three parts of red art clay. If you go down the Santa Fe clay in Santa Fe and buy a 50 pound bag of it, uh, that's the basic ingredient because it's the same thing as, as clay that's in the soil. You mix it with sand to loosen it up a bit, you put some plant mulch in there, you put in some seeds and you add just enough water so that it is so gooey you can't stand to put your hands in there. It was the perfect thing for kids to do. Uh, there, here's the seed mix that we put in there. Notice these uh, wildflowers in here. Uh, Mexican hat, purple aster, um, skyrocket, and Rocky Mountain Pensament. Those, we'll, we'll see them again in a couple of minutes. Here's what it looked like. Oh my goodness. This always brings back hor hor horrible memories. You know. uh, I would go into a, an elementary school gym, spread out tarps on the floor, and tell these kids to make mud. And the janitors were all horrified. Um, but we contained the, the mess. The kids would mix those three things into a four things into a bucket, add water, start rubbing their hands together to make little balls. You get your hands with that pattern that was that's that's when you know you got the right mud mixture. Line them up to dry, and then you do it again. We had every th third grader and every sixth grader in Los Alamos public schools and some homeschoolers who participated in this project. It allowed all of them to have an active role in the watershed restoration after Sarah Grande. What, best thing that I liked about the project was we could get kindergartners to get their hands dirty and we took it to the senior center and seniors also made seed balls and we're very appreciative of the fact that they, they could feel like they were participating when they couldn't go out into the woods, but they could do something that would, would help the restoration project. Got crazy one day when we decided to have a seed ball making contest at the pond where 
how many people were there? 30, 40, 50. I, you can see how many sea bulls. It was, it was a great day at, at the pond. What do you do with 250,000 seed balls after you store them in your garage long enough? Well, you got to get out there and distribute them. Well, the kids love this part. Uh, there had to be rules like you have to stand in a line and you can't throw them at anybody else, um, but scatter them. So everybody would line up and throw their seed balls out. Uh, yeah, uh, one, one young man even invented a seed ball launcher that you would stick your seed ball in and fling it. So everybody was enthusiastic about the seed balls. Did it work? Well, seed balls can sprout. The idea was that you would contain all the seeds in a hard clay mixture until it rained. And then once it rained, it would loosen the, the mud up and, and germinate the seeds. But what we didn't realize is they were so tightly packed in there that they, they kind of competed with each other. What we did was, it was very good for establishing wildflower areas. Here's those flowers that you saw in the seed mix, red, uh, blue flax, um, coreopsis, uh, Mexican had a couple of others. It gave us some, some nice wildflower meadows along the trails that were most used in town. So unfortunately, it didn't increase the grass cover, which is what the, your goal is when you're looking at watershed restoration, but it did make some nice wildflower areas. And it did, and this was the most important thing, it did allow a large part of the community to participate in the restoration project. And that, that was the project that was most. Margaret, pa Paul and Margaret White said they even had Russian exchange students doing some of that seed ball making. I, 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 I'm, sure, I'm sure that's true. I don't remember everybody who made 250,000 seed balls. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> so, and, and it also gave us the point, the, uh, a focus point to te teach about fire ecology and watershed restoration. And pretty soon everybody got the message. Uh, on the right here is um, Michelle Author's class, fifth grade class who had made seed balls, uh, made their own uh, seed ball personalities here and uh, gave me the poster, which I will give to Elizabeth and the Historical Society one of these days after I get tired of looking at it on my wall. Lingering effects, well, we converted a nice mixed conifer forest into an oak scrubland. Um, it's a different environment, it's still beautiful. It's a, it's a fascinating process to watch the recovery, um, but I know we all miss that forest. Uh, we still have some problem with invasive thistles. We don't have a problem with, uh, in, in the burned area with cheatgrass like we expected that kind of died out after a couple of years because the seeding mix was so successful that most of the native grasses returned within four or five years. Lingering effects, well, uh, FEMA gave us $12 million to improve forest conditions and reduce the fire threat within town. So uh, Los Alamos is in better shape than it was. Fire, fire, uh, forests are thinner and uh, more likely to, re to resist fire than they were in the year 2000. The fire code was updated and people were more aware of defensible space. Here, here's my example, this is my house. When I bought it, after the Sarah Grande fire, I went through the backyard um, and uh, we remodeled the house and build, rebuilt it up to the fire code with a metal roof, stucco on the outside, uh, impenetrable eaves, tempered windows on the outside. Um, so uh, most, there's, there's a lot of construction going on here on Arizona Avenue right now, and I'm seeing most of the people are, well, everybody's adhering to the fire code, but more, more of the houses that used to look like this board and bat and siding are becoming to look, to look more fire resistant. Y you know, this hasn't started yet this year because we haven't smelled smoke as far as I know, but many residents still react to the, that smell and uh, watch it, the uh, Los Alamos Facebook pages when there's a fire somewhere, uh, even in Arizona, the, it just lights up with people. Um, one of the roles that I try to play is, you know, hey, we have fire, I know where it is, it's in Arizona, don't worry about it. So it's PSD, yeah. Um, you know, we do have more open vistas from our streets and trails. The, the rocks are things that we didn't see back in 1999, but the rocks are a beautiful addition to our, our greening landscape. 
the trail work is much improved since it was uh, when the fire started. And, you know, the, the Los Conscious fire ripped that first day and it ripped to the south of us. And the reason it did that is because the Cerro Grande burn scar acted like a fire break for that immediate area. And if that fire, the Los Conscious fire, would have come straight into town like Cerro Grande did, it would have been far worse. So uh, Las Con or the Cerro Grande fire was tough to live through, but uh, it did a good thing. The whole idea here is that Los Alamos has, has proved that it's a, we're a unique place. This is uh, the Rodeo Chattisky fire. Uh, Greg Kiumjin said, hey, you guys did such a great job organizing volunteers. Can you come to uh, Heber, Arizona and do the same thing? Well, we did. We got everybody together. We, we taught them how to th throw straw mulch. The problem was twofold, is that the people who you see in the pictures are all from Phoenix. They're not from the immediate area. They really didn't have anything invested. They just you know, felt sorry for the people who had lost their homes. Okay, that's a good thing, but that's not gonna sustain your community effort. John and I took the volunteer task force model to two other fires and never saw anybody, never, no other community responded like Los Alamos did. So we are unique. We came through that fire because we believed in ourselves and we believed that it was worthwhile putting in a lot of volunteer hours to make things jumpstart. And I think we're living with that, uh, the benefits of that today because, uh, you know, if uh, we were all socially distancing and staying isolated without that landscape behind us to go and lose ourselves in every so often, it would be far worse. So a special thanks to all the folks who did this. This is, an, you know, it was a community effort, but these are the folks who stand out. Laura and Gary, Terry Fox helped us along the way. Greg taught us everything we knew. Al Toth, the, the unsung hero of the police department. Um, Megan Rains for getting, continuing this. I mean, you know, that Liz was there in when we first started, but the, you know, there are, there's a new generation of teachers that are still keeping that uh, volunteer spirit, that outdoor classroom thing going. So thanks everybody. I hope you uh, have a better appreciation for all the work that we all did together. We came through, we did it. We're going to do it again here in 2020. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Greg. Um, you know, I was a teacher at Mountain School at, during the Cerro Grande, and I want to thank you for all of your work that you did. And actually, everyone who volunteered, I know you made a difference, not only in our landscape, but in the lives of a lot of people. And so I thank you for that. And as we socially distance, <laughs> I think hiking a trail is a good thing. You see a lot of history on our trails in Los Alamos, and the Cerro Grande is just part of that. Um, there are a lot of other really amazing things that you can see on our Los Alamos trails. So if you have questions for Craig, if you want to type them in, I'm happy to read them, if we have any. Yeah, the weird thing for me is that, you know, probably a third of the community didn't experience this. And they, they had no idea of what it was like before and what it is. <laughs> what we did after after the fire. So ho hopefully we cleared that up for a few folks. Everyone's saying thank you to Craig. <laughs> Chip oh. Keller says that pine forests won't ever really come back. Do you agree with that assessment? Um, I, I don't think it's because of the uh, the fire. I, I, you know, the, the pine forests that were established where those seedlings are, are back. I mean, those trees are, are 15 feet high. You know, I mean, we're not going to see tall ponderosa pine trees in our lifetimes, but you know, some, some of those, uh, some of our grandkids might do that. Uh, so, you know, I think it, it, the uh, changing climate has more of an effect on where the, the pines are going to wind up than, than the fire did. Okay, I don't see see any other questions coming in? Great presentation. I loved all your pictures. 
That was awesome. Again, thank you, Craig. Oh, it says from Jeff Peterson, could you elaborate on the effects of the changing climate with regard to the forest recovery? Well, what they're finding, they're doing research up on, on the preserve, Jeff, that uh, is, says that, you know, the forest is, is gradually moving up slope. So where you have a mixed conifer forest now, you might have a ponderosa pine forest in the future. Uh, when I was doing some restoration work as the open space specialist, I planted some pinions in this ponderosa pine area. I had to see how that would work and uh, it, it's not ready yet, which is a good thing, I think, you know. So what, what we're gonna see is um, if you're doing restoration work, that you, you need to scale, go uphill with your restoration. Um, the Bandelier is doing that this year. They planted ponderosa pines in mixed conifer forests last fall and this uh, spring to anticipate that change in climate. Uh, whether or not that's gonna work, well, they've got good monitoring going on, so we'll see. Amy's asking, what would it take to establish more grass areas? Um, I'm not sure where we're not seeing grass right now. I mean, things are pretty well um, established in, in and above town. There are some bare areas, but it, you know, the, the Forest Service has spent, everybody spent enough money on, on Los Alamos. You know, we <laughs> have to do uh, on our own. And, and spreading grass seed is, is not a, a cheap thing. You have to hire an airplane to do it effectively. So, uh, and, and people are, are always saying to me, you know, you know, let's plant some more trees. And you know, you know, we still have 100 trees per acre up there in all those areas that were planted. And that's the density that we want. We don't want 500 trees per acre like we had before the Cerakote fire, because that's what got us in trouble. So, no, give those trees the Cochiti Mesa, you know, places that were affected by the Los Conscious fire, not, not this. So has there been a focused effort to replant the grass and trees for, from the Los Conscious fire? Um, no, because there wasn't a nuclear facility downstream, you know, to be, to be facetious about it, kind of, you know. Um, look, well, Los Alamos got a lot of attention because we lost houses and because of the, uh, the laboratory. Uh, folks up there in the Los Conscious area. Would seed balls be a good way of, would seed balls be a good way of establishing wild flowers in general, like I, a yard? You know, I still have. I don't know if we. Like 4,000 seed. But. I, I still have like 4,000 seed balls and I throw them out every year. It, on trailheads and places that need to be need some rehabilitation, and I never see anything grow. I think those seeds are too old, but uh, after doing all of that, I'm not a big fan of seed balls, to tell you the truth. Can you it's tell us anything more about the, the airplanes that dropped? Um, what were they dropping? Grass, grass seed, grass. You know, that there was that green that appeared over the mountains that really. It's very ugly yeah. green, but it was when they dropped. Uh, that, that was hydro. So what you do is you mix seeds with fertilizer and tachyfier so it sticks to the soil and you create that mulch layer by spraying it all over the ground. And that's what turned the mountains green. Uh, that was really expensive. So the watershed above Pueblo Canyon, which is upstream from the plutonium packets that were in the muds down, you know, way, way down in the base of the canyon. That's where it was cost effective to make that happen. But the rest of the area, the yellow airplanes just dropped seed and then that didn't turn the hills green. We, there, there is a, a program about um, um, restoration work that was done. Um, maybe we can do that for the next month. I, you know, anyway. <laughs> I did it for peak and I'm doing it for the mountain club of New Mexico tomorrow, but uh, we want to do it again. Uh, that's a, a cool show too. Okay, sorry. Uh, this wildlife return. Uh, huh? This year, there are more rabbits in my backyard, which is on the edge of the Saracone burn area, than ever, ever before. So I, I think between rabbits and deer, they're taking over. Uh, yeah, wildlife returns, especially when you start to get some grass and shrubs um, recovering. So yeah. I, 
Let's not see any more deer. I, I think we need a few more mountain lions at this point. Uh, let's see, what are we down to? How can we get rid of cheat grass in town? Hmm. I don't have a good answer for that. I, I can tell you that. I think that's Craig's connection, probably. Okay. Um, cheat grass in town. We have a quarter acre here on the edge of the burned area. When we moved here in 2004, we attacked the cheat grass and we jack it every year. And it's, it's way, way reduced, but that was pretty labor intensive and it was only a quarter acre. So I don't have a lot of hope for that. Pull it whenever you see it. That's all I can say. <sighs> Immediate post-fire seeding. How effective was the immediate post-fire seeding? Uh, there, in that seed mix, there was annual grasses that sprouted right away and perennial grasses, grasses that came the next year and provided cover then. It takes about three years for the effects to be no, noticeable. Uh, the first year seeding, you know, I mean, it, it helped, but it, what it did was retain soil for those perennial grasses that came the following year. What really helps it, by 2005, those grasses had sprouted so much and been smashed down by snow that not only were live grasses covering the ground, but dead grasses were covering the ground too. And that's what really does a watershed a lot of good because you've covered most of the soil with dead grasses. But you have to have those live grasses to make that happen. Ken, how you doing? Uh, let's see, A Aspen. Aspen grows back where it goes back, where it was originally, because it just sprouts from uh, the roots that are deep enough in the ground that they don't get scorched or, or damaged. Uh, we have some massive aspen stands now. I don't know if you drove into town last week before the oaks started, but you can tell exactly where the aspens are. The thing is they're removed from town. They're up at about 8,000 feet from 8,000 feet up. So they're not really right here that you can see. Uh, we used to go up there a lot in the, in the burned area uh, in the, that early 2005 timeframe. And you could, there were aspens everywhere, but they were only this high, and then they were this high, and then they were, but you couldn't see them from town. But now you, you can see them from town. Overall, I don't think they play a, a huge role in, in reducing runoff, but they sure are nice and they, sh they sure go back fast. I like that. Recovery works so well with volunteers because, uh, well, okay, sorry, I'm not gonna read that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. Here, if you want to see some hydro mulch, it's in the uh, it's, is it in the exhibit? I think it's in the exhibit. I think it's in the exhibit. There's some. I didn't see it on um, it, on the in the online version, but there there is a, a hydro mulch that I had in my basement that I gave to the museum. So. Hope you all take a look at the online exhibit. It's kind of our first time to try that. Um, the, the exhibit is being installed right now, the, the real exhibit in the museum. And as soon when the museum opens, you'll be able to go through and take a look at some of the objects. And um, the posters are a little bit different. Some of the information is similar to the online, but we hope you'll have a chance to swing by if, if we ever stop social distancing. But thank you everyone for joining in on our first online lecture. And thank you, Craig, for, for being willing to jump in and try this form of communication. I appreciate it. Sorry, yeah, live audience means a lot to me. And I, I could watch a couple of folks while I was talking that that's, that's why I wanted to do it live. Um, uh, Amy says, that you're gonna try to post this online. Is that, that, is that correct? This program online on a YouTube channel? And uh, it's, right. one of it's been recorded. So it's been re recorded. I let everyone know how that. 
And that, that reminds me that uh, PEAK has a uh, Parido Environmental Education Center posted the vegetative recovery presentation that I did a couple of weeks ago on their YouTube channel. So if you want to see that, you, you don't. Yeah, definitely, definitely go to PEAK channel no. and check that out too. Also, Terry Fox's book, collecting stories for years about the Cerro Grande fire and there's a whole new edition now looking back with even a little bit related to this pandemic going on and recovery in general so that will be available in the museum shop and and I'm sure um, we'll, we'll talk to her one of these days <laughs> will there be a rep presentation on the social response during and after the fire. Um, well, we did have Terry Fox scheduled for a talk um, sharing some stories also that um, was on hold. So I'll talk with Terry. We really would like to do some things in person and that's just really hard to do right now, but we'll see. Oh, and Amy posted the Peaks YouTube, which is awesome. You can click Thanks, on Amy. that. Well, thanks everyone for joining me here in my beautiful in my, office. My room, edges. my home. Yeah. Hope to see everybody in person sometime soon. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.